Singapore healthcare system has been rated by the World Health Organization as the best in Asia and the sixth best in the world in year 2000 and was never rated ever since. <laughs> in 2004, a political and economic risk consultancy ranked Singapore's healthcare system as third best in the world. And in 2008, the Global Competitiveness Report ranked Singapore second for infant mortality rate and 12th for life expectancy at birth. So Singapore offers universal healthcare coverage to all Singaporeans with a financing system anchored on the twin philosophies of individual responsibility and affordable healthcare for all. This system has evolved over the years with the current multi-tiered protection to ensure that no Singaporean is denied access to basic health care because of affordability issues. The first tier of protection is provided by heavy government subsidies of up to 80% of the cost of selected health care services. The second tier of protection is provided by Medisafe, which is a compulsory individual medical savings account scheme, which allows practically all Singaporeans to pay for their share of medical treatment without financial difficulties. The third tier of protection is provided by MediShield, a low-cost, catastrophic medical insurance scheme. And this allows Singaporeans to effectively risk pool the financial risk of major illnesses. Individual responsibility for one's healthcare needs is promoted through features of deductibles and co-payment in MediShield. As for Singaporeans who really cannot afford to pay for medical bills despite heavy subsidies by the government, there is the MediFund, a medical endowment fund set up by the government to act as the ultimate safety net to help needy Singaporeans. The MediSafe, MediShield and MediFund, as we passionately refer to as the 3M framework, is, has evolved to commensurate with times and expectations of Singaporeans. And this includes liberalisation of the MediSafe for many outpatient treatment and investigations and enhanced coverage of MediShield insurance plan, including that for congenital diseases, which we have, uh, many of us have fought for for many years. So having painted the sexy side of the story, let us look at the areas where more can be done to the healthcare system and to make it better. I've often received feedback from residents and friends on why can't they use their own MediSafe money as they deem fit, and that you know, it will be a great financial strain if their children are born with congenital diseases. And the old adage that it is better dead than to be sick in Singapore. And that seems to resonate with quite a number of Singaporeans. There is no denying that there are severe deficiencies in the current healthcare infrastructure. The sudden surge in the population over the last decade has resulted in a strain in the infrastructure resulting in long waiting times and near full occupancy of inpatient beds in the hospitals. Home care services are also in its infancy with room for further improvement. The restriction imposed on the use of MediSafe is also a big bugbear among Singaporeans, as what Professor Paul has also alluded to just now. Many lamented, you know, what's the point of having so much money in my MediSafe account when they can't even use the money to pay for my current healthcare costs. And I'm sure many of you have heard about this complaint and may have experienced it, you know, if you are practicing in the, in the hospital. I've also received numerous uh, feedback on the affordability of drugs. MOH classification of standard drugs seems to be too stringent, resulting in many drugs that are commonly used for many common conditions being listed outside the standard list for government subsidy. I think there is a need for a major review on the definition of essential drugs. Like any other country, Singapore will face challenges that are related to the demographic evolution and to the social, political and economic conditions of the country. Being one of the fastest aging population in Asia, Singapore faces the continuous challenge of addressing the healthcare needs of the elderly. The elderly population will naturally need more healthcare than the general population and will eventually take up a greater proportion of healthcare services. Singapore will therefore need to invest heavily and urgently on more infrastructure and manpower developments 
to address this increased demand from the impending silver tsunami. The right setting of care is also necessary to free up resources in acute hospitals. While keeping good health can be argued to be a personal responsibility, the government could do more in the areas of prevention and early detection of chronic diseases and cancers. Home care service and caregiver support in Singapore are still grossly underdeveloped compared to many countries in the West and in Australia. There is also a lack, on, lack of emphasis on social independence and improving the quality of lives of the handicapped and the sick and aged who wants to contribute to the society and continue to stay in their own homes respectively. The government should look into the provision and research and development of assistive technology for the elderly and the handicapped. The appropriate use of assistive devices can assist individuals to carry out the many simple and basic tasks themselves or with the help of someone else. With increasing affluence, chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, stroke and ischemic heart diseases are also increasing. Mental health and illnesses such as depression and Alzheimer's disease are important as Singapore's lifestyle become more fast-paced and with the aging population. The world is also facing a shortage of good quality healthcare workers. Many developed and developing countries are recruiting healthcare personnel from elsewhere to meet the domestic demands. Singapore is no exception. As Singapore attempts to attract foreign healthcare professionals to meet our own needs, our very own healthcare professionals are also being lured by better salaries and prospects elsewhere. To address the above challenges, it is inevitable that healthcare spending will have to increase. To mitigate the increase, there is a need to improve productivity and minimise wastage. Financial assistance must also be targeted towards those needy and low-income Singaporeans. The Ministry of Health has repeatedly reassured Singaporeans that no Singaporeans will fall through the cracks in terms of healthcare. So, have we arrived? Definitely not. There is much to be done and it will always be work in progress. MOH will need to constantly review and improve to commensurate with the social, economical, political situation and needs of Singaporeans. I think the truth is that provision of healthcare services requires resources and therefore does not come free. Someone must pay, but who and how? There are no easy answers, which is why no country appears to be completely happy with its healthcare system. Singapore faces the same challenge to calibrate and recalibrate the optimal mix between subsidies, insurance, and co payment by users of healthcare services. The government has to keep finding ways to push out the frontiers bounded by quality, accessibility, and affordability in a sustained manner. Only time will tell if we ever achieve an ideal healthcare system. With that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you very much, Pinmin, for a very thoughtful presentation. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Paul Tambaya. Um, Paul is the Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine of our own medical school. Paul, please. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me for this. Um, I, uh, I'd like to state right from the beginning that uh, I'm really excited to, to be allowed to present this. In fact, uh, it was Lena who invited me, and she specifically said that uh, I played a central role in drafting the SDP's National Healthcare Plan. But I'd like to uh, issue my own personal disclaimer, which is that I'm merely presenting the work of a committee uh, I'm not representing NUS or NUH, you know, I have to say this. Uh, and these are what I do in my spare time or my extracurricular activities. Uh, people ask me, you know, why do you get involved in politics? Uh, I'll tell them I'm not the only one. You know, there's a whole bunch of uh, public sector politicians. Uh, they all come from SGH, though, for some reason, uh, or Sing Health. And uh, uh, in terms of the universities, I think uh, NUS outnumbers NTU in terms of that. So uh, I don't think that's too much of an issue. So what I'm going to be presenting today is uh, what we presented a year ago. Uh, the Straits Times gave us uh, half a page, and uh, 